from the first floor. When we look at life from the first floor, it looks as though our problems are the ones that are the most important because that's all we can see. That's all we can see. And we're usually from the first floor, you're familiar with your neighborhood, so it's your, your, the street you live on, so to speak, symbolically and otherwise. And you tend to live a, among people that are very similar in some way to, to you. Expats move where expats are in, in other countries. They, we move among our own, so to speak. But eventually, we have to start moving our way up the floors of the building. Because when we reach a certain level, we realize this, this, this is not enough of a way of thinking. And on the first and second floor, we want life to be reduced to its simplest form. Two plus two is four. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's bad. There's winner and loser. And that's how we live. So on the first floor, Life is organized around the archetypal pattern of polarity. Night and day, good and bad, angel and demon. It's as simple as that. That's how simple life is. That's all there's to it, but it's not. But it's not. As you go up a floor, you start realizing that maybe there, there are other people, not just on your block, but there's a whole neighborhood. And, and what are they doing? And what do they have to say? What about their lives? And do their lives count in terms of the quality of life in this neighborhood? <clears throat> maybe, maybe. Well, I guess they do. Do they want to include me? I hope so. Then you go up to a, another floor and you say, well, beyond your neighborhood, you start seeing the state you live in, the country you live in. Each floor in yourself offers you a wider lens of the size, the depth, the scope of your life and your capacity to engage with reason, to engage with why did this happen? Why did this happen? What's going on here? Who are these people? When I was, when I grew up, my dad was a Marine from World War II and, <coughs> excuse me, and he was in the um, Marine divisions at Hit Guadalcanal. So he spent 44 months in the Pacific, and that really formed him. And if, if they could have identified PTSD back when I was growing up, I think my father would have qualified. He had reoccurring bouts with malaria all through the 50s, and then he would have flashbacks during thunderstorms that he was being bombed. And how that influenced me was that I thought, what's, what's wrong with my father? And my mom would say, Daddy went through a bad war. And, and this is, and I thought, hmm. And then I saw a movie when I was around, I think, eight or nine. It was called Guadalcanal Diary. And it had actual footage of the Marines' divisions landing on Guadalcanal. And I thought, oh, my God, that's where Dad, my first song that I could sing was the Halls of Montezuma, which is the Marine anthem. So. Um, my, I ran upstairs and I said, Daddy, the war's on TV. And he came down and he looked and there he saw this footage of the Marines landing and getting just massacred in Guadalcanal. And he started crying and he left the room. And now I thought I'd made my father cry. That was the moment I turned to studying war. I'm not kidding you. I have never not been reading about wars, military, conflicts, ever since then, ever since then. And I would, as the years went by, I would, you know, read five years on Russian history and the European history, Civil War history, just because the tendency, the need in us to solve problems with war to conquer other people, to take what's not theirs, to dominate other people, to be superior to other people. This is the darkness in human nature. 
it's, and it's universal. It doesn't belong to any country. It belongs to everybody. This is a human condition. <laughs> this, <clears throat> every single war, every single country was started by war. I mean, there were the wars everywhere, wars for boundaries, wars. Wa Washington fought in the Canada, it, 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 colonial war with, with Canada, trying to figure out the boundaries of who, who went where. And all the people that lose their lives when invaders come in. Need I remind you of American history before it gets rewritten? Conflict, wars, domination. This is human nature. Now, what's unthinkable is really this extraordinary moment in time. It's unthinkable that we could face an explosion in the Middle East. But I want you to think about going up the floor of your building and getting out of yourself, getting out of saying that can never happen because that's what got Israel in trouble. They said, oh, this could never happen, and it did. So you have to get to a floor inside of yourself that says, well, I've got to stop telling myself certain things can't happen because maybe they can, yes, indeed. Let's get to the floor where nuclear exchange can happen. And don't tell yourself again. We've grown so accustomed to, to living with an ever-present nuclear holocaust that we don't even think about it anymore. We don't even think about it. We actually think that it can't happen, which is exactly why it can. Which is exactly why it can. And as this temperament and fever of rage, resentment, conflict is brewing, brewing everywhere, in my city yesterday, a six-year-old Muslim boy, well, a six-year-old Muslim boy was stabbed to death by his landlord, by a, the landlord from the family. Why? Because he was Muslim. And the landlord was so enraged over the Middle East. He thought, well, not just Muslim, he's Palestinian. So he kills a six-year-old. That boy was sent to the hospital with a knife still sticking in him. Okay, I think that's unthinkable. This idea that our anger, our personal anger, deserves an audience, and not just an audience, but deserves that we are entitled to having the world change because we're angry, because unjust things happen to us. You know what? That's unthinkable. And it's unrealistic. And it's dangerous. And it's also in the language of Buddha an illusion. We cannot, all of us, decide my anger is so important that it could, it should reorganize the events of everybody's lives. My anger is my issue for me to deal with within my world, in the world behind my eye, not in front of it. Not in front of it. It is unthinkable that we can sculpt this world to be a just and fair place. I ask you, as someone who has been a lifelong student of history, to find me the moment in history where any people have accomplished that at all. It doesn't exist here. And what do our spiritual teachers tell us? It doesn't exist here. This planet wasn't designed for you, for us, for any generation to regroup, reorganize, and stop the chaos and decide everybody will have a fair and equal life. Why? Because there's darkness. There is darkness. There is greed. There is the sense that I deserve more than that person. There is racial superiority that drips everywhere. These are the elements that create the world we are now living in today, and it is unthinkable that it can sustain itself with these characteristics brewing in human nature, in human nature.